patients were just not getting better. He would give the same set of recommendations and some would improve and some would not. And so he designed this pretty elegant study where um, he used a large population of folks who were um, Kaiser Permanente patients. So they had um, health coverage through Kaiser Permanente and it was about 18,000 people. So a middle class, um, pretty uh, you know, reasonably diverse sample. And what they ended up doing was looking at um, people, they did an assessment of their physical health and then had folks fill out a really quick questionnaire in which they went back and thought, thought back to the age, before, before the age of 18, when they were children, if they had experienced any of these events, these adverse childhood events. And so those are the events of emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect or emotional, emotional neglect, um, having a household member who was uh, using substances, a household member who was mentally ill, uh, witnessing domestic violence, and having a family member who was incarcerated. And what they created was what they called an ACE score. So for every event that you had experienced, you'd get a one, and you'd add those up. So if you'd experienced none of these events, your score would be zero. If you experienced four, your score would be four. That would be your ACE score. And what they found was pretty profound. First of all, ACEs were much more common than they had thought. Um, within this sample, 50% had experienced one ACE, 25% had experienced two ACEs, and there was about 6% of the sample that experienced four or more ACEs. And um, it might not be that surprising to imagine, but ACEs often occur together. You can take a look at this and imagine if you have someone in your home who um, is uh, substance using, you may, as the likelihood of that individual being incarcerated or um, having some other risk factors or experiencing physical abuse or um, emotional abuse, those, two, those things might likely go together. It might not be that unusual to imagine those things uh, clustering together. But what was most um, sort of transformative about this was the sense that ACEs were powerfully predictive of adult physical and mental health outcomes. So individuals who had experienced ACEs in early childhood, four or more ACEs in early childhood, were 10 times more likely to be intravenous drug users um, in adulthood, 12 times more likely to have attempted suicide, um, and were twice as likely to have uh, physical health outcomes like um, cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, heart disease. So looking at ACEs gave us a better picture of, looking at these early childhood experiences gave us a better picture of how events can impact physical and uh, mental health outcomes. So how exactly do ACEs lead to these negative outcomes that I'm talking about? This pyramid is a sort of visualization of how um, early childhood events might lead to some of those risk factors like early death or physical and health problems, physical and mental health problems. So you might imagine um, a child who's experiencing chronic community violence and let's also add the threat of deportation to this. And so this individual is um, living in a community where they're maybe experiencing, experiencing a lot of violence and this chronic exposure sort of leaves this child on edge. We'll talk a little bit about the fight or flight response and how this might actually look in a, in a, in a minute. But you think about this child as someone whose neuro, neurodevelopment is actually disrupted by this child who's um, easily startled, irritable, maybe having difficulty concentrating in school, <coughs> difficulty concentrating at home. And then as they progress through school, you're seeing that they're having difficulty with peer relationships, they're experiencing more meltdowns in school, and maybe eventually just really starting to feel very disconnected from school in general, which might increase the likelihood of this child dropping out from school. And if this child is dropping out of school, then what, what um, other risk factors might they be exposed to? So you think about some of the adoption of other health Then these additional layer of risk factors, these health risk factors, increase the likelihood that this leads to disability and um, in this case we're talking about a broader disability problem. So this individual might be more, um, more likely to develop heart disease or be incarcerated or um, have contact with um, police and might have increased in obesity. And then we take that, you know, those risk factors that those increasing disability risk factors then um, increase the risk of early death. So this is kind of the model for thinking about how adverse childhood events might lead early death outcomes or, or physical health outcomes. Um, but I think what's really important to point out here is that this is not a straight line, right? It's not one to one. It's not if you experiencing, if you experience these adverse childhood experiences, then you're definitely <coughs> going to um, sort of trace through um, negative outcomes. What we see is there's lots of opportunities in this, in this pyramid for folks, for adults, for systems to intervene and provide support. And there's also lots of opportunities for individuals to be resilient, their own internal resilience through factors, other adults, the supports that they have in their community. Um, so this helps us understand why early childhood events might lead to poor outcomes. It also gives us a model for thinking about where we might intervene and how we might provide additional support. So I want to talk a little bit when I, you know, in that previous slide we talked about disrupted neurodevelopment. And I want to think a little bit about what's going on in um, a moment when you're experiencing, when you've experienced trauma or how that might um, later be related to kind of your general physiological responses and wellness. 
How many of you are familiar with the fight or flight response? Good, great. So this is our, this is the reason that we are here and alive today. This is a hardwired, very adaptive response that keeps us alive. It, kept, it kept our caveman ancestors alive, being able to assess a threat and get yourself out of there or fight in a situation in which you might be able to fight um, is really adaptive and it's a survival mechanism. Um,
someone were to come into Rebecca or my, my office and we were trying to provide a diagnosis, these are the symptoms we would be looking for in order to provide a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, PTSD was a diagnosis that was developed after working with soldiers who had gone away to war and had come back. These veterans came back to environments that were safer than being, you know, being in battle, being in war. Um, but there are ways in which this might not match up for kids or for families who don't necessarily get to have a host to their trauma. The trauma doesn't sort of end when they're in this exposure to kind of chronic stress. But we want you to be thinking about just very briefly the idea that what we're looking for um, in these diagnoses are the experience, the re-experiencing category of reactions. So that's flashbacks or nightmares, kind of these intrusive thoughts that pop in throughout the day about the event. Um, we're looking also at a category of reactions that um, fall under avoidance. So that's maybe not wanting to talk about the event, maybe um, you're being kind of numbed out and not really having emotional responses to um, the experiences. And then um, it might also look a little bit like dissociation, like just kind of zoning out, tuning out, and not wanting to think about things. Um, and then we think about these other two categories, hypoarousal. So this is going back to that fight or flight response, individuals that are in a constant state of hypervigilance, kind of looking for threat, um, and might consequently have more irritable outbursts. Um, and then negative alterations in cognitive and mood, this is that sadness, um, depression, anger, or withdrawal. So changes in, the, in your cognition and in your moods and kind of feelings about the world. So this is what we would be looking for, but what might you see in your work? You're not diagnosing people with PTSD, but you might be coming in contact with some, um, some kind of uh, behaviors that would fall under this, um, under the, the kind of different reactions category. So anyone anyway, think about what you might see in your spaces if you were encountering someone who's sort of re-experiencing trauma? What might that look like? Uh, I would guess either like in a, uh, like during the intake interview or something, um, getting really um, confrontational and upset with, with certain lines of questioning or being allowed to avoid them for not wanting to answer questions that might be really important for their legal representation, mm -hmm. but also like, yeah. yeah, not having any knowledge about that. So maybe being kind of avoiding
might not necessarily be connected to negative alterations in cognition or mood, but we're, we're thinking about here are those individuals that look pretty withdrawn, feel pretty hopeless. They don't seem, you know, they're not, what's the point? I'm, I'm feeling kind of hopeless about the future and what, you know, what I have to look forward to. Um, and they might also, so you have this combination of either looking really kind of irritable and moody and sort of withdrawn, or um, alternatively looking sort of numb, like they don't have emotional responses to things. So they don't get really happy, don't get really sad, just kind of um, emotionally sort of numb. So these are some of the things that you might <coughs> see um, in your work. And I want, I know one thing that I sort of wanted to touch on a little bit earlier, but I, after we've kind of gone through this and thought about this, what kinds of trauma are people coming with, um, you know, coming to you with in the work that you're doing? Um, we kind of describe what trauma looks like and what the symptoms look like, but as you guys consider the work you've been doing summer, like, are there certain things that now you're saying, oh yeah, this is the kind of trauma I'm looking at? I was going to say, I started to describe the story of the impoverished stuff. So a lot of poverty. Thank you. 
and it might shape the way in which you're responding to new stressors that are happening in your life. Um, so we want to briefly just kind of think a little bit about, and we're going to turn back out of time, so uh, just think about how also <laughs> the current social political climate um, for marginalized youth and family, there's sort of um, been this increase, increase in discriminatory action and intimidation of minorities, and we know that lots of youth are feeling like some of the political rhetoric has created, um, has sort of emboldened people to feel like there's a license to, to talk about, um, you know, to, to be racist and act in, in ways that um, would not have been typical or would not have been as you know, socially sanctioned before. So we're seeing an increase in distress over the past several months, and there's been an increase in the number of hotlines to, or hotline calls and suicide hotline calls. And so um, we want to be thinking about this as an additional layer of context in which students and families are operating um, in the world right now, and to just be sensitive to these ideas of how we need to support folks um, who are experiencing some of these kind of stressors. Um, I think when we think about what the context or what the, the impact is of um, some of these additional, you know, additional stressors that I talked about in the other slide, beyond this trauma, we're thinking about increased anxiety. Um, it might show up as increased physical illness, lower self-esteem. Folks might be feeling more depressed. There might be an increase in suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, kids might be having more problem behaviors at school, um, you know, acting out uh, due to distress, and that you might see um, sort of lower school achievement, but also thinking about those additional stressors as compounding and accumulating trauma. So the individuals that we want to be focusing on, which are individuals, it sounds like that are folks that you all are working with, individuals who are most vulnerable <coughs> to this additional distress and mental health issues, are folks who might be visible minorities, either due to skin tone or to um, uh, you know, religious garb that they're wearing that makes, that, you know, makes them more visible as a minority, um, folks who are gender non-conforming youth, refugees and immigrant youth, um, folks who have, folks who are you know, DACA recipients or might have family members who are undocumented, um, and folks who have kind of limited English proficiency um, might also feel more vulnerable right now. And then thinking about, you know, from the mental health perspective, folks who are vulnerable are those who've been exposed to other people's suicidal behaviors. You might have family members who have been suicidal or who have their own pre-existing risk, risk factors. So um, might have been exposed, uh, have depression, anxiety, have had previous suicide attempts. And so we want to be thinking about kind of looking out for those uh, vulnerable individuals and how we can provide um, additional support or how you can just be attuned to what might be going on. So I think it's a lot about this idea that we talk about is that trauma impacts how people think, feel, and behave. And so we want to um, think about what beliefs individuals are carrying with them about the world, about themselves, and how we can help them think that, uh, how we can help them feel more safe and capable and likable and kind of what we can be doing in our work that helps people reach past these ideas. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Um, great. So again, my name is Rebecca Poyka, and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. We're going to switch gears now, right now. Um, we're going to now be understanding the impact of trauma on child development and behavior. Let's focus more now on trauma-informed strategies that we both practice. And although some of the slides that you're going to see here are largely focused on working with children and youth, many of the same strategies are going to work with uh, to work with adults and their families that we may also be in contact. Um, trauma-informed advocacy first recognizes that current and high, prior exposure to violence or trauma has an impact on physical, emotional, psychological, and behavioral well-being and development. Um, trauma-informed practice demonstrates understanding that because a child endures a trauma, he or she may have a hard time um, explaining what happened or remembering details. Um, different people tell stories in different ways, and the trained will need to help to formulate a coherent timeline. <coughs> trauma-informed advocacy also responds to child traumatic stress through legal representation that reflects awareness of trauma's adverse impacts on the use of context-based legal systems. So if you think about India doing work with refugees, no? Okay, well those who do work with refugees often they'll experience, their experience is that uh, refugees will shut down during these processes, and why might that, may that be? Refugees often <coughs> experience interrogations as part of their persecution process, and um, that whole experience, the mindset of persecution that is experienced in their country before coming here. So they may shut down during an entry interview with, a, with an attorney. Trauma-informed practice also includes, includes routine screening for trauma exposure and mitigated symptoms. And it trains working with this population to understand, you know, how do 
probably not going to get it all done in one day, especially working with this. I know that attorneys often feel a lot of pressure when we have a statement to get the affidavit completed as soon as possible. Um, when you're working with this, um, it's, it's really hard for kids to recall specifics in one day, you know, one particular um, day. So attorneys involved in common work advocacy are also going to need to think about collaborating with professionals involved with the child in this particular case, um, recovery and resilience for the child and family. And part of that means in making resources available uh, to children and families on trauma exposure, its impact, and treatment. Um, and also engaging in efforts to strengthen resilience and protective efforts for children impacted by trauma. Um, and lastly, if you're working with parents and caregivers, you need to consider that they too may be victims or um, have experienced trauma themselves. So to establish a trauma-informed lawyer
what students are under their control. Um, it's just a preview that your journey with them will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And to mention that at the beginning of your relationship and throughout your relationship, so there's conscious recognition of your, the limits to your availability to them. Um, you'll want to explain to them, too, why you're seeking particular information and how it will aid your representation. So that may not be readily evident if they've never gone through a, a file before. I give the client information to help you make an information, informed decision about how much they really want to share with their trained adult. Um, and it maximizes your chance of answering the phone book. So I'll be important to let them know what your work hours are and when you'll be available to them. Because if they start calling you and giving you 10 voicemails a day, you may need to start setting some limits and expectations about how often you'll be in contact, within what time frame you'll be able to return a call, and maybe even set up regular preemptive check-in calls so that you can help manage their anxiety about space. Try not to make promises you can't keep, like I'm always available to you or things are gonna work out, don't worry, because you really can't guarantee that, and broken promises only serve to reinforce that adults can't be trusted. Um, so whenever possible, try to avoid those blurred boundaries, um, making exceptions, friending them on social media, um, because this all makes for confusion. Also try to avoid creating a false sense that you can rescue the client or foster a sort of dependence on you because that will become yet another loss to your client when you're rolling his or her life is over. Um, and the last tip, kids are inquisitive and they may ask you some personal questions, so be prepared for that. If it seems like it's an innocent question and it's crucial to rapport building, it's often harmless to answer those questions. Um, but obviously you don't want to be revealing personal information like phone number X and phone number and things like that. But if you feel at all uneasy answering the question, then you can ask them why. Why are you asking? Um, and if you feel comfortable answering after that, um, and it seems like if you don't answer, you're going to break rapport, you can give a brief answer. But if it's inappropriate to answer, for example, if they seem romantically interested in you or they're looking to um, develop a reciprocal personal relationship with you, then you can say that as your attorney in the context of a professional relationship, it's not really appropriate for you to answer a personal question. And you can remind them that you're there to help them with their legal situation and you care about them. However, your relationship is a professional one. You also want to be connecting them with adults in their lives who can be more permanent for them. So whether that's a caregiver or a school staff or mentors and coaches, it's important to help that child identify who those people are going to be in your role in their life at some point. And when your professional relationship ends, acknowledge this. Make room for a positive goodbye because a lot of these kids haven't had a, a good goodbye or a positive goodbye experience at all. Um, so acknowledge that this is unlike a lot of relationships where you go to those close personal things because you're not going to have ongoing contact with them. Um, and explore positive ways to, to say goodbye, whether that's exchanging photographs or cards or allowing them to take a memento from your office with a pen or a fidget toy um, or just sharing food to celebrate the work you've done together. So <clears throat> once you've established this trauma informed lawyer client relationship, there are several strategies to infuse trauma informed practice into your work. Um, first of all, you want to think about how to create a safe and comfortable environment. And this can be done in a variety of different ways. One way is to meet in a location that provides both physical and psychological safety for the child. So that might be a private area away from your parents or another adult who may fear their reaction. Particularly if a child is triggered by telling you her story, you want to remind them that they're in a safe place. Help the youth feel safe and control and offer choices, like would you like to get a drink of water or take a break? You can also remind them that you're here for them and that you're going to wait for them to tell their story when they're ready. Um, forcing a child to talk has never been really successful. Um, even little things like seating arrangements can ma ma matter. Um, so sitting directly face to face with an authority figure or sitting in a lower position to an adult often creates a sense of unease and guardedness in children. So sitting at the same level or next to them or getting down on the floor and playing with them is really going to help them feel more comfortable, build trust, open them up a little bit more. Some kids have experienced trauma really want to avoid sitting with their backs to the door because they want to know who's coming in and out of the room at all times. Um, some will prefer to have the door closed and others ajar. So giving them that sense of control about where they sit in the room and how they want the do door position is being trauma sensitive. Um, kids also don't respond super well to direct intense interrogation and questioning. So <laughs> engaging other activities like easy snacks and playing and drawing can help them build, uh, build trust. It's not going to put pressure on them to have an intense focus of an interrogation or a questioning. And 
connect with services and to help them accomplish their goals. So most people don't forget their um, kind of childhood memories, but we know that the more you try and forget something, the more it bothers you, and the more um, it comes out through nightmares or intrusive memories. Um, so telling the story can be a way for them to really get control over their memories or for their memories controlling them. And in general, we want to model good emotion re regulation. We want to demonstrate strategies for them and help them label emotions um, and let them know that
measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So that means you're saying, I want to exercise more. I think that will be helpful to me. But don't just say, I want to exercise more. Say, I want to go to a class on Tuesdays from 7 to 8, and I'm going to do this for the next month, and I'm going to go with a friend who's going to hold me accountable, and we're just going to see how this works as a way for me to build more self-care in, and we'll figure out whether or not this works out for me, or I need to try something new. That way, you're giving yourself a goal that you can actually achieve, rather than just saying, well, self-care will do it. I want to really, really quickly, because I know you guys have to leave, just think about these ideas of professional self-care as well. So make sure you're getting supervision when you need it, and make sure you're taking breaks when you can get it. Um, to feel like you can create space at work where you have healthy boundaries and you're not taking on too much. And also, um, you know, if you're in a position as you go forward in your career, thinking about the, having space to say no to things. If you need to not feel like you're taking on a new project, make sure that you're creating space for that. And checking in on um, self-care as well. Organizationally, just really quickly too, thinking about the idea of getting continuing education as a form of self-care um, and using supervision or communication with colleagues as a form of self-care too, um, because it helps you be able to do your job more effectively. Um, and also within organizations, you know, some of the activities you guys are talking about, like your happy hour and those activities, those are celebrations and events that within organizations can help folks take care of themselves. And so it's good to be thinking about how you're doing that. So I would encourage you guys to, um, you know, look at that self-care strategy um, handout and actually really sit down and set some goals for yourself and then try and practice them over a time limit period. So over the next month or so, and see what works for you. Um, and then think about how you can build this in to be part of your larger work moving forward professionally. Um, there are some additional resources that we'll share in here that are relevant to folks working with 